Okay, my name is Mark Dorley. I'm the director of the ethics program uh, at, in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Villanova University. And um, if you're listening to this, you are going to be a participant in the December Philadelphia Regional High School Ethics Bowl here at Villanova. And um, I'm here with my two colleagues who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves now. My name is Brett Wilmot. I'm the associate director of the ethics program here at Villanova. My name is Mark Wilson. I'm assistant professor in the ethics program here at Villanova and the coach for the Villanova Ethics Bowl team. Villanova has been involved with the intercollegiate ethics bowl since 2000 and um, every year we send a team and the intercollegiate works similarly to the high school. There are regional competitions and then uh, the teams that do well at the regionals are then invited on to nationals. Uh, we're going to do the same thing on the high school level. So the regional is here in Philadelphia on December 1st, and you've already received 15 cases. Um, and the goal for you ought to be to kind of get, get clear about what you think the issues are for each of those cases. Um, the questions that are at the end of each case are meant to help guide that a bit. Those are not necessarily the cases, the, the questions that you'll be asked at the competition, but they're good questions for getting you to, to explore all the dimensions of, of a, um, a particular case. So we had originally talked about going through every single case, have everybody come to Villanova to do that, and it struck us silly to make you all come here if we could simply do this videotape and put it up on, on the web and you could have access to it. It also seemed to us a little bit um, um, unreasonable to slog through every single case, 15 of them. It would be about two hours if we were to do that. Um, what we decided to do, uh, for your benefit and for ours, is we, we each picked one of the 15 cases and we're going to each talk about our case for three to five minutes, um, outlining what we think are the relevant issues, the, 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 the things that um, we would anticipate you'd want to talk about in your argument, um, your presentation. Um, and then we'll have opportunity for uh, some discussion based on, on what each of us says about our case. So this is going to be about 35, 40 minute uh, videotape. We're going to look at three cases and uh, we hope it's helpful. So I'm going to start and the case that I'm going to talk about is number 12, about the polar bears. And I uh, just want to remind, remind you of that case. Um, it concerns what to do about the fact that the polar bear um, natural habitat is under attack because of the climate change uh, around the globe. And uh, the habitat, natural habitat, of course, uh, is the ice cap. And uh, the polar bears uh, need that ice to be as thick as it is to survive. Uh, and of course, they're losing habitat uh, relatively rapidly and some scientists expect them to be extinct in 70 years. Um, so in response to that people um, have come up with different options and the main one is to um, try to capture um, more polar bears, create, um, create as close as possible natural environments within the zoos that exist around the world and hopefully uh, not only keep them uh, thriving in the, in the zoo environment but maybe at some future date, perhaps when uh, climate change has been stabilized, to, re, um, to reintroduce them to, the ha to their natural habitat. So I wanna, I, and the questions are, um, are these. In, is increasing the number of polar bear exhibits in zoos an ethical way to attempt to save them? And would this strategy, strat, this strategy be ethical if used to save a physically smaller species? So I'm kind of, actually going to address both questions, but I, I, the, the first and fundamental thing is the, the reason we're even having this conversation is because the climate is changing. Um, the climate is, the global climate temperature is warming and of course there's an ongoing debate about the degree to which that's because of, of human interventions into the environment or if this is a natu natural cycle. Whether whatever one of those is, is in some ways um, a side issue to what to do about the fact that the polar bear uh, population is uh, threatened. Um, I'll speak more about how global warming can come back into it, but, but, but by and large to get into that would be almost irrelevant about the point at hand, which is what's the best way to deal with the fact that the, the habitat is threatened. Um, 
So you have a species that is suffering. You have um, the ability of human beings to intervene to uh, try to address that suffering um, and to uh, protect it, protect that species. So there's a distinction I'd like to introduce here, which I think is helpful to thinking, thinking about the ethics of it, which is the distinction between um, what might be what, what is called an anthropocentric view of nature versus a biocentric view of nature. The anthropocentric view, which is pretty much the way we all have been taught to think about nature, is that um, nature is there and is valuable because of what it can do or what it can offer to human beings. Um, the biocentric view, on the other hand, thinks about nature as having a value in and of itself. And how one comes down on either one of those is going to uh, impact the way one thinks about this particular case or any case related to the environment. Um, now the anthropocentric um, uh, uh, view has come under, under increasing criticism from people who, especially when it comes to zoos, because zoos have been created in order to, um, for, for, have been created for several reasons. One, educational. You bring these animals, these species from all over the world, you bring them into a zoo and the people that live in that area can come and learn about, a lot, about those animals. So, laudable goal. Another reason is because people enjoy animals. So they enjoy seeing these animals, perhaps not in their natural environment, but they get a lot of joy in, uh, out of that. And, and a third reason, which is relevant to this, is um, zoos have become um, a, a way in which um, human beings can intervene in species that are close to extinction, extinction to try to um, help them, to, to save them from extinction and then eventually to reintroduce them back into the wild, which is what happened in, as it says in the case with some of these other species. So, but notice the first two, the educational piece and the enjoyment piece as a reason for zoos is based on what's important for human beings. The, um, the idea of, of intervening in order to keep that species alive arguably could be said to be more motivated um, or, or potentially motivated not so much by what's in it for human beings, but what's in it for the animal. So a more biocentric view where the animal's interests are driving the conversation as opposed to human interests. Um, so what's a zoo? So, so by and large though, our zoos are there to serve human interests. So the idea of bringing the polar bear, putting him into a zoo, putting thousands of them into the zoos, even if you try to create a habitat that's similar to theirs. Um, uh, is that driven more by the anthropocentric piece or is it driven more by the sincere interest in the polar bear? Do we want to keep the polar bear alive for our own educational purposes and for our own enjoyment or do we want to save the polar bear out of some uh, respect for the polar bear as a species? Um, now, one of the interesting questions about the, about, or one of the things that I think is important to pay attention to is if you're thinking about it from a biocentric point of view, the animal's interests become primary. So think about the polar bear. As it points out in the case, polar bears are used to ranging over thousands of miles of territory. Um, they migrate, they're, they're nomadic, and um, they, um, that's their nature. That's what polar bears have done. They've, they, over time, have developed that as a way to survive. We can bring them back into zoos, we can confine them into relatively large, but certainly not thousands of square miles large, uh, 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 confines. Um, is that going to serve the, the species, the, is that going to be something that's going to um, uh, satisfactorily address the interest of the species, which over, uh, over millions of years has developed into this particular kind of animal that roams? So what's driving that, a kind of a concern, do we want the, so what I would be interested in paying attention to or, or, or teasing out is what's motivating the desire to keep the polar bear alive? Is it, is, and is the means by which we would keep the polar bear species alive um, serving the human interest more so than it's serving the polar bear's interest? Now we'll go back to global warming. Um, I said I was gonna address that. If it's the case, that human beings are responsible for, um, in large part, for climate change, then I can see a case being made that human beings ought to do something to address the problem they've created, that we've created by our own behavior. And so one could say that that's, that's a laudable goal to try to uh, save the species from extinction because of our behavior. But I still am caught up with, with whether or not um, one could argue that the interest of the species is to survive, even if that means you have to confine it. 
and then later on you can release it back into the nature. Or can we intervene in another, can we, can we maybe intervene in another way, um, spending, spending much more energy on, or much more time um, making an argument for um, uh, demonstrating that human behavior is the cause of global warming and therefore trying to change that behavior so that over the long term the, habit, the natural habitat is saved, if not as large as it is now, at least stop its, its, its accelerated decline. Um, if, I, if I'm arguing as more of a, from a biocentric viewpoint, it seems to me reasonable to me to want to say that um, by trying to, well intentioned as it is to save that species uh, in the way in which will work for us, is being driven more by anthropocentric concerns than to actually do th something that would actually serve the interest of the polar bear as a species, um, which is to, to do whatever, what we can to, um, even if that means lower numbers, to try to maintain them in their natural habitat and start to change our behavior so that the natural habitat is, is uh, maintained. So anyway, so those are some of the things that I think are important to pay attention to here. Comments from my colleagues. Mark. <laughs> Let's see. Um, well, I, I feel like that covered things pretty well in this case. I think that the, the questions are trying to push us to think both about the moral, what we might call the moral status of animals, um, what is owed to them, how they stand in relation to us, what, what might constitute justice, uh, a claim of justice in the case of our relationship to the species. Um, Mark pointed out that um, some of this could be explored simply in terms of our responsibility in creating the problem and therefore, you know, we broke it, we ought to fix it. Um, others focus a little bit more in terms of the information in the case about the, the, the distinctive challenges in preserving the species and doing so in a way that, that actually allows them to flourish and thrive and possibly be reintroduced back into their nat um, natural habitat. Um, with a lot of these cases, you're going to find that the, the point is that there's a right answer hiding in here. It's that you're going to have to begin to work out to your own satisfaction what you think the more compelling values are and how you might begin to go about um, developing a, a, an argument in favor of those values in, in light of the information in the case. So Mark's done a nice job of trying to highlight where some of those values might be found and some of the technical language that we might use to, to talk about them. Um, and then it's going to kind of come down to you guys to figure out um, which of those approaches just feels more persuasive to you. I think that's good. All right, good. That's good. Okay. All right, Brett. Yeah. Well, uh, again, my name is Brett Wilmot. Um, I chose case six, the SAT debate. And again, just to remind folks what this was about, it, it, it largely has to do with whether or not the, the use of the SAT is for, for admission to public universities is a good idea um, and, and, and the case talks a little bit about some of the, the good things that the SAT can do in terms of identifying potential for academic success and it also talks about some of the issues in terms of, of that we might associate with fairness in terms of whether the use of this is strictly fair among all the parties involved. Um, I've drafted out a few notes just because it helps me keep organized. So I'm going to read through and identify some things that I think are particularly interesting or important about the case. Again, with the idea that, that I'm not trying to suggest a particular answer or direction you would need to go in, but simply trying to highlight some of the moral concerns that an ethicist might be um, worried about in a case like this. And I've identified two basic prongs or, or ways of approaching the case. One, uh, I associate with, with the idea of fairness or justice. Um, I, I feel like the, the, the study questions are actually oriented in this direction. So the study questions are, should SAT scores be required for admission to public universities? And should students be allowed to take their best scores for submission? I take those to be trying to, to get at issues of justice or fairness. And what I would suggest is this, that if, if, if that's the way you want to approach the case, you'll need to consider what fairness means in terms of assessing outcomes without bias. Um, that's one aspect of it. So the idea that fairness means you know, trying to figure out a way of taking a, the outcomes from the SAT and evaluating them or evaluating the outcomes of a, of a wider procedure for admission to college. 
But you also need to consider what fairness means with respect to the process as a whole, or what I might call procedural justice. Both may be relevant, I suspect they are. A lot will depend, of course, on what you believe we're trying to accomplish by using things like the SAT. Is the point to promote those individuals who, regardless of whether they have certain advantages in preparation, show the most promise for academic success? This is an emphasis on their, on their ability, right here and right now, and not really a question of their merit, not something about how hard they've worked to get there or what advantages they had, but simply right here, right now, under these circumstances, who, has, who shows the greatest potential for success? In that case, then equality of starting points is largely irrelevant. An example I might give that you might be uh, familiar with is something like the National Football League Scouting Combine. In trying to measure the potential of football players to achieve success in the NFL, there's no concern about whether certain players have benefited from advantages that others lacked in terms of their pre present ability to score highly on various tests of physical ability. The purpose is simply to take a group and evaluate them in terms of their current potential, their ability, right here, right now. If, in contrast, we're interested in a fair procedure by which to screen students for a social benefit, in this case access to a public university, in terms of their merit, in terms of you know, what work they've done, you know, how hard they've struggled, um, what they've overcome, um, then it's reasonable to be concerned about whether certain students enjoy an unfair advantage because of their social and economic status. The test may do a great job of providing an unbiased assessment of a student's potential for academic success in college, at least in the first year according to the case anyway. But as a fair procedure for rewarding individual merit, I suspect it falls short. Family wealth is irrelevant for assessing individual merit, and insofar as the test is biased in favor of the affluent, we have grounds for criticizing this process from the perspective of procedural justice. So you can kind of see how there's these two, you know, the justice and fairness issues, both in terms of, of assessing um, ability uh, without regard to prior effort or accomplishment or starting point, and the other issue of fairness in terms of the procedure as a whole, is everyone on a level playing field? And so those were, those were the, the study questions I think try to elicit and, and where you might want to focus your attention. The second approach, and I, I'm only a little res, reticent to bring this one up because it's going to be a little more complicated and it's, it's a little more um, contentious, I think. But um, this has to do with competing goods in terms of our understanding of the aims of public education. Um, this is a potentially more difficult line to pursue, one that raises questions about whether higher education is a good to be distributed based on individual merit or potential, which is what the fairness debate was about, or whether it, 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 higher education, public universities are a mechanism for promoting a vision of the common good. Um, the first approach takes a more individualistic view, the second a more social view. Those are other goods you can kind of think about in unpacking different cases. Uh, you know, thinking about the individual, individual rights and, 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 and responsibilities over and against kind of social concerns. If a college education at a public university is simply viewed as a limited good, the distribution of which should be decided primarily in terms of who is better able to compete for it, then the SAT seems like a reasonable mechanism. Maybe not the sole mechanism, but certainly a, a tool we might use. We might still debate whether this mechanism is fair, Again, see, the, 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 my previous comments were kind of focused on that. But our ultimate concern will be with fairly rewarding individuals, either based on merit or potential. If, however, we consider higher education from a more social perspective and have among our aims the promotion of a diverse learning community in terms of social, economic, gender, and racial differences, addressing historical injustices, for example, based on, on racism or sexism and other examples we might identify, and promoting a more egalitarian social more egalitarian social and economic development, for example, by encouraging more professionals from underrepresented communities, then a sorting mechanism like the SAT that seems biased in favor of the already affluent will be far from ideal. This, of course, is part of the affirmation affirmative action debate, and we all know that that's very charged. Um, and that's why, again, I was somewhat cautious in raising this or suggesting that this may be a little more difficult approach. So taking this, I think, will require a certain degree of subtlety and nuance. Just again to point out, as with Mark's case, um, our goal here is simply to provide you with some tools for identifying various values that are at play in these cases, ones that you may find paralleled in other cases, and, and to suggest ways you might begin unpacking those for, for thinking about the cases. So that's what I have. Good. Well, um, just, I just want to make one comment about one of the things that Brett did was he, he used a parallel example 
so the, the, the football combine, um, that's a very effective tool. So if you're you know, looking at a case and you can think of a parallel case, and you have to be careful about what case you choose. I mean, the parallel has to be appropriate. Um, but if it has the same kind of structure uh, as, as what Brett pointed out, it's very effective to, get the, um, to demonstrate the principle that you're trying to articulate uh, in guiding your deliberation. Um, so I just, I just wanted to underline that. It was very good. And I would just add that, you know, one of the things that you're trying to achieve in your analysis is consistency. And so similar cases ought to be treated similarly unless you can identify a morally relevant difference. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you can't identify a morally relevant difference, say, with the football combine, then the implications uh, of, of that follow. The only other thing that I would mention with regard to this case uh, is the way is, is sort of expanding the focus and thinking about it in terms of the admission process mm -hmm. more generally so that one's position on the case might be influenced by the weight that the SAT is given mm -hmm. in the admission process so that while in some ways it might be the least worst option for one component mm -hmm. if it is one among a more holistic uh, analysis of the student's merits. So just again, to sort of expand the, the, uh, the, the framework. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Though one thing to keep in mind too, we've learned this at the, at the College Ethics Bowl level, is that, that we're often encouraged to try to stay within the, the, the kind of parameters of the, of the case as presented, and, and there's sometimes a desire um, to go beyond that a bit, to either draw upon other experiences we may have had or to something we may have read or seen on TV or, or, or these kinds of things. And you want to be a little bit careful about that. And I don't think that's what Mark was suggesting, but it just occurred to me as he was saying that in terms of broadening it out, is just to, to be on guard a little bit in terms of trying to bring a whole lot of additional information that you think you know or that you've researched. This really isn't, um, other, other forms of debate uh, emphasize research a great deal, your ability to gather additional information and develop a, a strong argument based on that. Ethics Bowl doesn't quite work that way, and Mark, you may want to speak to that because you have more experience with it than, than I do, but the idea is, is less that you've done extensive research than that you've developed a compelling argument um, for a moral position based on um, primarily on the information that's available to you as the case is described. Certainly we'll instruct the judges here at the competition to focus principally on the, the cogency of the argument uh, and not to be wowed by a display of factual information. Good. Facts in themselves don't, don't indicate any sort of argument. Good, good. Okay. Mark, you're up. All right, well, the case that I chose is case three uh, about the use of Ritalin and Adderall as study aids. And there are ways in which this case has parallels with Brett's, and I, and I think you'll, you'll hear some echoes of that. What I would like to do is just to give a sense of how I would approach this in terms of competing models uh, of ethical inquiry. Right? So, one model of ethical inquiry or analysis would be in terms of what's sometimes called utilitarianism or, or consequentialism, essentially a cost-benefit analysis. And I think this case readily sort of invites that kind of analysis. If we were to engage in, in a sort of cost-benefit analysis, the, the first thing we want to do is identify what we take to be the key stakeholders. And so in this case, uh, I might suggest that among the key stakeholders, at least, are the individual students who are taking the drugs, uh, that student's peers, their classmates, and then the broader academic community and, and even society at large. Right? And so then when we begin to unpack the case, we might then look at the various uh, benefits on the one hand and the various potential harms on the other that affect each of those stakeholders. So for instance, the, the, the benefits to the students seem fairly obvious. Right? It seems to enhance one's ability to concentrate, one's focus. It augments one's attention span, and thus leads students to perform better in very, uh, very compact study periods. Right? The drawbacks are also fairly obvious. Um, there are side effects to the drug, uh, including everything from increased heart rate to 
the other end of the spectrum, strokes, right? The, uh, the drug is also addictive, uh, and its efficacy diminishes over time. And so as we begin to uh, acquire a tolerance, higher doses of the drug are needed to create the same effect, right? Not least, it's also a Schedule II drug, right? And so question, it is, in fact, illegal to take these drugs. So again, these by way of potential harms to the student. Um, with regard to peers, again, if we're analyzing in terms of, of uh, benefits and harms, there seem to be a lot of potential harms as that would align with some of what Brett was talking about. With regard to fairness, uh, certainly the drug is not equally accessible to all students, so you have some students who are going to have a competitive advantage with regard to acquiring the drug, which may then turn into a competitive advantage uh, in their performance. Uh, furthermore, there, there's a systemic uh, problem at, at at least potential problem, that there's going to be considerable pressure on those students who currently are not taking the drug to take the drug in order to achieve a, a, a similar baseline or an equality of opportunity. Um, and then finally, there, there's sort of a, a law of diminishing returns effect, that if all students begin to have access to the drug, does this then imply that stronger drugs will become attractive? That, that students then, in order to reacquire the advantages that they have, will seek out more potent and potentially more dangerous drugs? At the level of the community, and again, all of this by way of thinking in terms of, of benefits and harms, let's say. At the level of the community, I think some of the principal concerns are going to be whether or not students upon leaving college are properly representing their potential and their talents. That is to say, if their high grades were a function of this ability to focus intensely over a short period of time with the assistance of psychotropic drugs, does this imply that their performance will in fact diminish once they're in the workforce, or that they will have to continue to use the drug to maintain that level of performance? Um, there are also questions about the way in which as this in, it becomes infused in the college, let's say environment or even high school environment, whether there's a trickle down effect, right, so that now you have middle school children seeking out the drugs so that they can get grades in order to get into high school, to get into college and so forth. Uh, and there's the broader sort of black market concern that because it's an illegal drug, are we essentially creating uh, a, a, a new target for the war on drugs, let's say. Now, much of that is, I think, the, the sort of intuitive approach that, that most will have to this case. I would just say another way of looking at it, and this is more the way Brett did, is in terms of focusing on the goods at stake. And that approach is, is somewhat more complex, but it's gonna begin, I think, with an exploration of the question, what is the purpose of education? and again this dovetails with Brett's case, is the purpose of education to create a hierarchy of students ranked, upon, or ranked by their performance? Or is there a, a more <clears throat> excuse me, expansive or robust aim of education to cultivate a certain sort of person, to cultivate certain virtues, intellectual uh, and otherwise, and if that's the case, then we might analyze the use of the drug in light of that good. And so then you run into questions such as, what is the real benefit for the student if the aim of education is to cultivate a richness of character, to cultivate a, a depth of knowledge, and to cultivate a certain um, diligence, for lack of a better word, by the student. And, and if we analyze it that way, then the benefit of getting high grades on discrete assignments seems to take on a, on a, on a different look. Uh, so too, at the level of, of the academic community, if, if our goal is to create a certain type of person, then it might suggest not only, and, and bear in mind Brett's caveat that we, you don't want to go too far afield, but it might suggest not only that Ritalin is counterproductive insofar as it, 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 is, it, 
it allows one to demonstrate the, the sort of knowledge acquired through cramming, right? Um, but it may not, in fact, contribute to uh, a rich understanding of material or a rich understanding of concepts. We might then ask if, if the university at large is somewhat complicit in promoting ranking systems and promoting uh, a type of educational system where this sort of drug has such obvious uh, academic, quote unquote, benefits. I think that's good, I mean, by way of an overview. Yeah, no, I thought, and, and again, I thought there, there, you really do see, as Mark noted, the parallels between the SAT debate and, and this kind of debate, and certainly at the level of, of thinking about what the purpose of education is for. Um, one thing that occurred to me was, again, sometimes I think we get caught up with thinking that the purpose in an activity like education or sport is simply to maximize um, achievement in an absolute sense, you know, get people to run as fast as it is humanly possible to run, to jump as high as it is human possibly to jump. Uh, um, in, in this case, to memorize and to 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 function at a at a at a high level for a short period of time on something like an examination. And what that misses is a more holistic vision of human flourishing or human well-being. And, and, and sometimes, I mean, we can all be complicit. So I liked what Mark was saying, that the university itself or edu you know, education institutions themselves can be complicit in, in generating a demand for these that students are reacting to. Um, and so that, again, opens up the possibility for looking at some of these cases anyway from that perspective is what are the larger goods, either communal or individual or institutional, that we're trying to accomplish and then trying to evaluate why a certain you know activity or practice is is either good insofar as it promotes those or, or bad insofar as it is um, harmful in some ways with regard to those goods. Well, along those lines, uh, and something I meant to mention, I mean, one way to tease out those questions is again to think of it either in parallel or analogically with something like the use of steroids in baseball, which mm -hmm. is suggested in the case. Yes. In competitive sports, some have argued that there should be no resistance to the use of steroid, uh, steroids or other performance enhancing drugs because what we want as a society and what they want as players is simply maximal talent. Mm -hmm. One might then ask, is that really what is at stake in higher education? And if it's not a purely competitive exercise where we want to maximize achievement, then what really are the, the goals and how does that uh, influence our thinking about performance enhancing drugs? Yeah. Or even our sense of achievement has to shift a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, we're still talking about achievement, accomplishing something, but we shift our attention away from something that in some cases may seem the obvious goal in an activity to something that's a little more complicated but that may require a more nuanced approach to a practice like taking steroids or, or taking Ritalin or so on. One other minor point, and I uh, just wanted to emphasize this because um, you're going to see this come up, or many of you are going to be aware of it, at least in the background of certain cases, the question of legality, um, what, what is or isn't legal. Uh, it may be important to note that, and there are certainly moral dimensions to uh, obedience to the law, respect for the law, these kinds of things, but just to be clear, legality by itself doesn't establish the moral status of a behavior or a, an activity, these kinds of things. So you just, uh, it's not that you can't talk about the moral status, and you may even want to point out that, that, that you know, at a, at a kind of first look, to violate the law may be subject to moral criticism, but we never want to slip too casually into saying, oh, something's illegal, therefore it's immoral, or something's legal, therefore it is moral. Um, and so uh, while there are issues involved here in terms of legality and the legal status of these drugs, that alone shouldn't be decisive to your analysis of, of, of whether or not their use is appropriate. Um, we can all think of examples, historically at least, where we think um, what has been legal has been profoundly immoral, as in the case with slavery. And, and many of us even today may feel that certain things that aren't legally permitted ought to be, and, and that that ought is a moral claim. And so just wanting to, to draw that distinction in your analysis was, is always important. The only thing I wanted to add was, was that um, I was struck by when you, when you were doing the, um, looking at the stakeholders and talking about the cost and benefit stuff, it, insofar as if we think about education as 
um, a merit-based thing. So, so we, we have a hierarchical end game, and so we want to be the high at the top, similar to sports. If that's the way it is, then um, those harms that you're identifying, especially the harms that are associated with um, you know, becoming addicted to it, needing more and more, all the, and, and also the fact that the harm of, of in, in, um, seducing other students to use it so that they could have the same advantage, all of that gets undermined mm -hmm. if the if if it's about getting a certain goal. Because if uh, you know, I'll do what I need to do in order to be successful. We do that. And that's that's the way we think about lots of different things. We want a, we want something. We want to buy a new car. Well, then I need to do what I need to do to buy the new car. And that's where the discussion about good the goods at stake mm -hmm. can kind of begin to put limits on the, our wants. You know that some things are the goodness of something can trump my want, um, uh, although that's a much more difficult kind of, as you were pointing out, it's a much more complicated, much more difficult kind of case to make. Um, uh, although it becomes it becomes a kind of, you know, if, if you're if you're responding, so part of the ethics bully is you're responding to other arguments. So you can imagine a, another team who's dealing with this case is basically making the consequentialist argument. Hey, look, there's, um, you know, people are achieving these. You know, they have certain goals that they want to achieve, and uh, they're making use of means that that um, the harms that we're talking about are really outweighed by the benefits that go on. And they might make that argument. Our critique of that would be uh, to bring in this whole uh, account of the good. Like, what's at stake in education? What are we trying to do in education? And does this behavior serve that that good, independent of whether individual desires are met? So. Um, that was a little longer than I anticipated talking, but uh, anyway. Anything else? I can't think of anything. I'm I, I'm assuming that that as part of their preparation, they they'll they understand the format of the events. Right. They know that in some cases they'll be taking the lead and then they'll be responding. Right. So, I mean, one of the things that you want to do with all of these cases is you certainly want to begin to identify the path that you really find persuasive, the most powerful kind of position to take on this. Um, and, and, and also be prepared though to, to try to work out what would be um, natural lines of, uh, of criticism or potential weaknesses. And so if, if, you're the, if you aren't the presenter for that case and the other team effectively makes your argument, um, that in some cases you could step in and, and raise challenges. You could point to some of the, the potential concerns that you had and, and when you were trying to work out your argument. So things like that, just to be aware of how the dynamic works. The teams aren't going to be forced to take one side or the, or the other of a, of, a, of a case. It's not pro and con as in a debate, but rather you're always going to want to have your position worked out, but then you're also, just insofar as the other team may share that view, to, to be in a position to point out some of the um, the difficulties or the challenges in, 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 in maintaining it. You want any last minute words of advice for prep? Perhaps just that, <clears throat> and some of this you received in, in some, some suggestions that were passed along, but to avoid thinking about it in terms that might mimic much of our political discourse, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, that your objective is not so much to beat your opponent's uh, or beat your opponent's argument or, or, or certainly not to belittle your opponent's argument, right? But to present in your own view uh, a, an analysis of the goods that are at stake right? and, and then as clearly as possible explain how those goods permeate the case and how your position relates to those goods. Without, uh, without attempting to engage in, in histrionics or, or sort of a vitriolic uh, attack on your opponent's position. Um, so just again, a reminder some, uh, to some extent about the, the ethos uh, of, of the competition. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I was gonna, that, that I wanted to underline that because it's, um, what, the, what the ethics bowl model is, it's about, it's about dialogue, about, uh, important issues and that everyone uh, com comes into it with the spirit of trying to arrive at the most adequate analysis and judgment about the issues in a case um, where people are going to disagree um, and, and but we can disagree in a very civil way 
uh, understanding the point of disagreement, understanding why the disagreement happens, uh, uh, even if we disagree. Um, the, the other thing I, I wanted to, as you're preparing, it's very important to, 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 for the entire team to be somewhat familiar with every case um, for practical reasons, it, as opposed to, it's pedagogical reasons, it's great to work as a team, but for practical reasons, uh, time and time again, you get up there, the moderator asks a question, and the person who's supposed to present freezes. Well, when that happens, you've got a real problem if no one else knows what that person was going to say. So it's really important. It doesn't mean you have to be the expert on the case, um, but you, you, need to, you need to be familiar enough with the contours of your, of your, of your colleague's uh, argument that you could step in, God forbid, if they freeze. Um, the other thing is about the, about the responses to, to, to the other team's argument. Um, it's always helpful to, to, to have a question to ask of them. Not a million questions, but one question. So, um, you know, as, as Brett suggested, they may make the same argument that you make, and, and, and so, but you, are, you know, because you've already been thinking about it, what are some criticisms people could have of my argument? And you can kind of rehearse some of them. Well, what about, we thought about this, and, and, and here's where we think it might be a problem for, our, for the position that we both agree on, and what about this? And at the, at the end, or, or, or not so much ask those questions, but present those alternatives, and maybe at the end say, I'm wondering what, what, our, what our colleagues think about X, and then finish. Um, because one, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, respectful because then the other team kind of gets an agenda for their response. They got to answer your question, right? They don't have to come up, make up stuff uh, or rehearse their argument, which is, you don't want to do that either. You don't want to just say over again uh, what your argument is when you're responding to, to someone's commentary. You want to try to develop points, address their concerns right away. Um, so it's, it's meant to be um, uh, um, dialogue. You know, we're not in it to, to uh, belittle anyone or uh, to show how some, somehow we're superior to the other. Uh, it's about being friends and talking about really important issues. Um, so thank you so much for paying attention to us. We hope this was helpful. Um, your coaches have my email address. Um, so if, um, if you have questions, you don't understand something, um, you can always pass them on uh, to me through your coaches. I'm not going to give everybody my email because I don't want you all emailing me. So if your coaches email me, that's fine. Um, we are very excited to host you here at Villanova, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on December 1st. Thank you.